We're going to talk about data analysis in Excel. Now before we start, I have to say this is a huge topic. We're only going to skim the surface. Data analysis is becoming more and more important in many fields of endeavor. And I listed business, medicine, sports, politics, you name it basically. You can read a lot about this in the media. There are some good books and articles out. Uh, one I saw recently was called The Age of Big Data, and I gave you the information here so you can look it up. It appeared in the Sunday Times on February 11th. Um, the movie Moneyball is about this kind of thing, about using data analysis to gain an advantage in picking players for a sports team. So it's a theme that's becoming more and more prominent and that more and more people are using. In the business world, retailers use data about sales, the economy, and the weather to tailor product selections at their stores. Shipping companies study their data to help improve their delivery routes and the timing of when they might deliver to certain parts of a city. Uh, police departments use analysis of things like arrest patterns, holidays, sporting events, paydays, and weather to try to predict where there might be an outbreak of crime and prevent it by having extra officers in the area. So, as I said, many different fields of endeavor, all using data analysis to help drive their decision making. Now, Excel has a ton of features. In a way, I would compare it to a Swiss Army knife. What I mean by that, if you have like thousands and thousands of lines of data, you expect your data to be huge, then you should be using a database you know, a specialized tool. If you're going to do extremely sophisticated uh, statistical analysis, you should probably have a statistics package. But if you want to try out some ideas, if you want to get started doing data analysis, there are a lot of features in Excel that will let you experiment with the kinds of things you could do with a more expensive, special purpose piece of software. Now we're going to just scratch the surface here, as I said, and look at a couple things that we can do with Excel. So let's say you have a situation and you want to analyze your data. Well, I'd like you to think back to the beginning of the course where we did our four steps. Remember those? Requirements, specification, execution, and test. Uh, execution being implementation. Well, it's the same with any process. So here the first thing you want to do is think about your requirements. And the thing to really consider is what data are you going to use, are you going to need to analyze. And you want to think about this carefully in advance because it's a lot harder to go back and add data than it is to be collecting it as you go along. And as an example, I'm going to use my real estate example uh, in this session. And it struck me after I started thinking about doing data analysis with it that, gee, it would have been nice to have something like uh, dates in there so we could compare quarter to quarter, uh, something like that. You know, in the real estate business, which, believe me, I know very little about, so any of you experts, forgive me if I say something wrong, but I understand that, uh, at least in certain neighborhoods, there's much more activity in some seasons of the year than in others. Well, it'll be interesting if you're in that business to analyze that and maybe see where you should focus your attention during one season, during another season. When should you take your vacation? Stuff like that. Again, just think about what kinds of data you need to collect in order to do the analyses that you would be interested in. Once you have that, you can design the table that you're going to build, and that's how we're going to collect our data in an Excel table. What fields should it have? What types should they be? And once you've done that, you can design a data collection form similar to the one we used in the real estate pivot example. So it would have it'd be a form for user input. Uh, you can set up ranges with your selections for different um, uh, list boxes and so on so that the user has choices to pick from, things like that. You think it through, do a mock-up, and even walk through, okay, how would I enter my data using this? Uh, maybe show it to other people who might be using it if they're going to be entering data. So you have a real idea 
of whether it's useful or not. Now we're going to look at doing something like that and then applying pivot tables and pivot charts. Again, there's many other tools you could use, different statistical tools and more sophisticated data analysis tools and so on. Uh, Excel also hooks up to external data sources like databases of various types. So th this is just an example, not by, not by any means a thorough discussion. Now once you have decided about your data entry method, you want to make it as bulletproof as possible. So for example, this is why we use list boxes for entries instead of having people type stuff in. That way we know that it's consistently done. So we can do analysis looking for those fields. Uh, you want your code to check numeric entries to see if they're legal. And we saw how to do that in our error correcting um, versions. You can also include, include a reasonableness check. So in my real estate example, we're not going to have any sales for under, say, $10,000. So you could check for that and give a warning if some number that seems unreasonable comes up. You can have the code make sure required fields are completed. We saw how to do that. Uh, consider an option to delete the last entry. Suppose someone does an entry, hits return, and then goes, oh no, I shouldn't have done that. Well, I haven't set that up, and of course you can always shrink the table, but it's nice to have a button for a redo. Uh, one thing I did add to the example that we posted for this session is an autosave option. So every time a person pushes the button to create an entry, it also gets saved. The, the workbook gets saved. And with anything like this where you're collecting data that's going to be critical for your operation, you want to be sure that you have an external backup process. So I store my file actually on an external server you, you should have something. Okay, now once you have your table, you can use it for as a basis for multiple pivot tables and also for pivot charts, which we're going to look at. I'm going to do the main example here using Windows, but you can also do it on the Mac. And there are some slides at the end that just show you what it looks like on the Mac. The basic idea is quite similar. So here's a picture of my data table, and I'm going to go over to Excel now. And you can see that since I made this picture, it had 25 entries. Uh, now I'm up to line, well, it was up to line 25, I should say. Now I'm up to line 33. And just to demonstrate, um, here's my Add Data button. I'll pick somebody. Let's see, Claire's maybe should have a turn. Let's say it's in the Pearl. Um, Let's say it's 750999, and we'll, I'll oh, just to show, I haven't chosen a commission rate, so now I will. Much better than having the program crash. Okay, and here we go. So, now I could keep adding, but one thing I'd like to show you, this is set up as a table, and when I add another line using my program, the table is automatically ex expanded. So this line is now part of the table as you um, you can see the little mark down here, it's pretty tiny, uh, that shows the limits of the table. And also the fact that we, are, we have our um, alternate color lines going. So you can tell this new line has gotten incorporated into the table. Now let's take a minute here and take a look at the code. So I'll go to Developer, Visual Basic, and first of all, instead of having a workbook open sub, what I did was just create a sub that shows the form, and I connected it to that button that says Add Data on my main spreadsheet. Then within the code here, uh, if you remember in my previous versions, there was no assumption that you would keep the data in between opening and closing this, the workbook. So it would always start by adding the data to the first data row. Well, what I wanted to do here was have it keep its old data 
while I close the workbook, and then when I open it and I add new data, it goes on the end, as you saw what happened. So in order to do that, I have some code in here where um, it goes through and it looks at each row until it finds a row with the first column entry empty. Uh, that is, the length is not bigger than zero. And at that point, I stop incrementing, and that becomes my current row, the row to put things in. The other thing I did here was to fix so fix it up so that instead of using the row source property, which you can on Windows to initialize the list boxes, instead I'm using a for each loop in the range agents to initialize my list of agents list box and in the range of uh, neighborhoods to initialize my neighborhoods list box. Okay, so let's go back to uh, PowerPoint here, and I'm just going to go through. This shows you what I just did, and that a new line is inserted. Now let's take a look at the pivot table. So I've actually got two pivot tables here. I'll explain that in a minute. But here's my first pivot table, and it just has my list of agents, and then subordinate to that, the list of neighborhoods. And I made that happen by first dragging agent down here, and then neighborhood, or you could just check agent, and then check neighborhood. And then I drag price over to here, and I have the sum of the prices. Then under the pivot table tools, I can choose pivot chart to create a chart like this. And this gives me a nice visual impression of how each agent is doing in each neighborhood. Okay, now I made another pivot table here. This one has, let's move this over so we can see everything. This one's organized by neighborhoods as the main thing, and then within neighborhoods by agents. And then I have the sum of the prices, the average price, and I also have the count. In other words, how many sales have I had in each neighborhood? Now this pivot chart, pivot table, is intimately linked to the pivot chart. And in fact, to show how that works, let's do a new one. So I'll go back to sales. I'm going to select my table. And then I'm going to create a new pivot table. So let's go to insert pivot table. And um, this table is called sales data table. So I'm going to use that. And I'll put it on a new worksheet. OK. Now, what I want to do in this analysis is figure out for each neighborhood how many sales I have. So I'm going to start by taking neighborhood and making that a row label. OK. And now um, what I'm going to do is put the price down here. Um, but what I want to do instead of sum of price, I want to know the count, how many. So what I can do here is go to value field settings, pick count. Okay, and now I can see how many sales I had in each neighborhood. So, so sum is not just for sum. It's for, there, there's a number of different ones. You saw minimum, maximum, uh, different types of analysis you can do. And now let's just say I want to do a chart on this. I can go to pivot chart. Um, I seem to like column charts, so let's do that. Okay. And here's a column chart showing me the distribution of sales by neighborhood, uh, by count. Now, if I wanted to do by average price instead, I, what I would do is do another chart on another page. Because if you try to change the chart, um, it also changes your pivot table. So you can't, when you do a pivot chart off of a pivot table, it's basically got to have everything that's in the pivot table. And if you remove something, it will also be removed from the pivot table. Now, let's see, this one could be a good example. 
suppose I decided that, oh, the count is silly in this chart. So let's come over here and um, say, all right. You see, there's no difference. I, I clicked on the pivot chart. It's taking me to the same design page for the table. And now if I take this off, um, let's see, remove field. Okay. It's off the chart. It's also off the table. The other thing is, whenever I do something like this, I lose my formatting. So I might want to have these things, uh, because they're prices, formatted as numbers. And that's great. But as soon as I do something to them, to the chart, you know, or the table to change it, I'll lose my formatting. So important to remember, don't spend a lot of time doing elaborate formatting unless you know you're not going to change things. The other thing is refreshing. And um, what I can do here is just refresh. And you can see it updated all my data, but again, I lost the formatting. So just watch out for that. Okay, but it's not a big deal to uh, redo these. Oops. Let's get that. And this. And it does give you a quick way to do an analysis and make a nice presentation. Okay. As usual, you need to play around with this to really appreciate what it can do and the kinds of analysis it can give you. All right, so I'm just going to zip through these. We talked about adding a pivot chart, and I showed you how to do that. One of the big points of doing this is that I only have to do the data entry in one place. The pivot tables and pivot charts are all connected to my basic data table. And we've talked about this before, the principle that you don't want to have duplicate effort, you don't want to have data in duplicate places because then you run a huge risk of having it become inconsistent. So that's very important and part of what we were doing. Okay, now I'm just going to take a minute here to show you what it looks like on the Mac. So on the Mac, um, when you want to create a pivot table, you go to the Data tab and then there's an icon for pivot table that you can use. These fields, it looks a little different, but it's basically the same questions that are being asked on the Windows version. And the Pivot Table Builder, similar types of fields, it just looks different because it's black instead of white. Um, here's building the pivot chart. I just selected the pivot table and then um, went to this chart icon and chose a stack column. And here's my chart. Now, interestingly, it turned out a little different than the one on Windows. In this one, um, it has a column for each neighborhood in addition to the columns for the agents within the neighborhood, which the Windows one didn't have. So just a little difference in the design there. I don't think it's quite as nice, but your mileage may vary. And this just talks about changing from using row source, which I described before. Again, we add a new row to the table by using the data entry form. And the same program that's posted will also work on the Mac, doing the refresh and so on. OK. So basic idea, bottom line, on the Mac, on the PC, not that different. So again, these are useful tools. There's other useful tools which you can explore, but I think it's worthwhile to know about these and to play with the example a little bit so you get familiar with it and see what kind of things could be done.